Okay, everyone, it is now uh, 12 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, we want to welcome everyone here today to the 2022 Indiana Small Farm Conference uh, program session for today on value-added products, and thank you for being here. Um, we want to do a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Um, however, uh, we would like to tell you that if this is your first time using Zoom, um, just out of etiquette, we you know want to make sure you understand. Um, please leave your uh, mics on mute. Um, you're more than welcome to um, raise your hand on the Zoom icon option to ask questions, and we will call on you when appropriate. And if you'd like as well to um, put your question in the chat box, our moderator, Matthias Engel, today will uh, try to answer your questions or we'll read those off as we go along as well. Uh, we also want to make mention if you uh, require closed captioning that feature is available so if you'd like to use that today all you need to do is move your cursor to the bottom of the screen and hover over the closed caption icon and from there you can select to show uh, or hide the closed captioning option so thank you very much for that as well um we also want to recognize all of our sponsors today um, and for the, the entire conference, as you see on this slide. Um, we want to thank them for all that they've done. Without their support, it would be very difficult to, for us to provide all the information that we do, uh, whether it be virtual and hopefully next year face-to-face um, -face, uh, makes our program very successful from year to year. And we appreciate all their patronage and time that they put into our program as well. Uh, before we start our program today, we do want to collect some demographics. So at this time, if you would take a few moments as a participant to um, either take your phone out and take a picture or capture the uh, QR code that is on the, currently on the screen, it just asks for three questions. It is anonymous. Um, it just asks three questions about some demographics so that we know who we have today in our program. And as well, Matthias, who is moderating, has just now placed that link to that demographic uh, QR code as well in the chat. If you just want to click on it from that aspect as well, they can get you there. So I'll give you guys about two or three minutes to complete that, and then we will start our program. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Well, if you need more time, please use the link um, that is provided in the chat box to complete that demographic page. Um, but this time we will uh, start our program here shortly. But we do want to thank our actual program session for today, our sponsor, Safe Produce Indiana. Um, they cover a lot of different things. Their purpose is um, Safe Produce Indiana serves as a fruit and vegetable growers and consumers in the state by educating them about U.S. Food and Drug Administration, FDA, Food Safety Modernization Act, and produce safety rules. Um, so we really appreciate them sponsoring our program today. And if you would like more information on what they do and some contacts, uh, that information is available in the Indiana Small Farm Conference program book that you have access to as well. So at this time, we will switch over to Victoria Herring and Emily Boos and allow them to pre present today on our topic, how do you add value-added products work into your business? So at this time, um, I want to introduce Victoria. And I, at that time, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. That oh, looks like Jerry, we already did. Um, so at that time, we will have, like I said, Victoria is an Indiana native and the business development director of the Indiana State Department of Ag. Uh, she has a, been a BS, has a BS from Indiana University, Purdue University, Fort Wayne, and is a graduate of the Oklahoma University Economic Development Institute and the Indiana Leadership Forum. Victoria works with the Indiana Agribusiness and Communities to develop business goals 
to leverage the state into a national leadership position in agriculture uh, with an economic impact of over $31 billion um, a future agribusiness propel Indiana's diverse agriculture economy. As well, we also have Emily Boos, um, who is Economic Development Operations Specialist at the Indiana State Department of Ag. Uh, she manages several of the department's grant programs, including the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program, Farm and Ranch Stress Assistant Network Grant, and the Federal State Marketing and Improvement Program. Uh, Emily has also worked with the Economic Development Division to create business resources and outreach programs to better connect with Indian agribusiness. Uh, she's originally from Alabama and she graduated from Southern Illinois University Carbondale in 2019 with degrees in communication studies and history. So at this time, we will allow Emily and Victoria to present our program today, so welcome. Thank you, Jeff. So yes, my name is Victoria Herring and I am the Business Development Director for the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. And what that means is that I get to help all in Indiana agribusinesses uh, make sure they have what they need to be able to stay and we hope grow within Indiana. Uh, I also get the good fortune to work with several other organizations across the state, including the Indiana Economic Development Corporation, as well as local and regional economic development groups on attracting agribusinesses into Indiana, which would include value-added manufacturers. Um, so yes, uh, I have been at ISDA a little over two years now. And prior to that, I had experience working in a local economic development role in Grant County, where I still live. So I've got lots of background and experience in uh, assisting local businesses with whatever uh, they may need. Um, Emily is going to join us here in uh, just a little bit, and she's really the expert on all the grants, and so she's going to go over those as an opportunity to maybe help with some financing in your value-added agriculture business. Um, and this is very informal. If you have questions as we're going along, please do feel free to put them in the chat box or raise your hand. Um, I'm more than happy to pause and answer any questions as they may come up. So we today are talking about value-added agriculture. So as a High level overview, we'll talk about what value added agriculture is, how it could help you potentially diversify your revenue streams, and then who to talk to if you are thinking about pursuing value added agriculture as um, an option for your business. So, there we go. The definition of value added agriculture from USDA rural development is really kind of three pronged. So the first um, way that products could be value added is by changing the physical state or form of the product. So think about milling wheat into flour or taking strawberries and making those into jam. Taking a commodity, a raw commodity, making it into something else. The second way is the way in which you produce a product. So the production of a product in a manner that enhances its value as demonstrated through a business plan. So think about something that's organically produced. So just in the way that you produce it adds value to the product. And then the third way is the physical segregation of an agricultural commodity or product in a manner that results in the enhancement of the value of that commodity or product, such as an identity preserved marketing system. So uh, specific traits or characteristics of that product um, or the growing production or marketing channels. So think about being able to have traceability back to where this product came from. That's another way that you can be able to add value. So as a result of the change in physical state or the manner in which the product is produced, the customer base for the commodity or product is expanded and a greater portion of revenue derived from the marketing, processing, or physical segregation is made available to the producer of the commodity or product. Examples of this are food, beverage, health, and beauty products. Uh, here we have a photo of Simple Goodness Soaps, which they are um, a maker of soaps, lotions, beauty products that are made from goat milk. Um, pet food and textiles are another good example. So it doesn't necessarily have to be a, a consumable product. When I was doing research for this presentation, I came across this quote and I thought that it was really good to share. The value of farm products can be increased in endless ways. 
by cleaning and cooling, packaging, processing, distributing, cooking, combining, churning, culturing, grinding, hauling, extracting, drying, smoking, handcrafting, spinning, weaving, labeling, or packaging. And I attributed where that quote came from here, but I thought that it was just really good to add to this presentation because basically value added, there's, there's lots of different ways to do that. And not only, again, food or other consumable products. So really what it boils down to is think about what happens to the raw material once it leaves you. And what part of that process could you do and take over in order to capture that value yourself? There are a couple different ways of thinking about value added production and processing too. So first you have capturing value. So think about that as taking part of that process into your own hands. So an example of that would be a bunch of farmers coming together and forming a co-op for uh, local meat processing. So when you're thinking about capturing value, there's really more of an emphasis on attention to market competition and controlling the production costs versus creating value where you're taking the raw product, making it into something totally new and unique. So the organic, local, and then again, the foods and um, beauty products would be an example of this. And the emphasis here is really on new production techniques, product development, this could also even be a service. It doesn't necessarily have to be um, making something new, but maybe it's just delivering it or distributing it um, and really doing a lot of market analysis there of uh, what's needed. So when you're talking about value added and adding value to your products, really what it is, is a way for you to diversify your business and bring in another stream of income. So as you're diversifying your products, um, you, you could still do, you know, what you've always done with your raw product or commodity that you have on the farm, but now you also have another way that you can sell it by preserving it or processing it to extend shelf life. It also broadens your customer base because you can still have your original customers and do things the way that you've always done, but now you can appeal to a wider audience um, and, and gain new customers. Um, and you can also think about new opportunities that you might have for yourself. You, you may be in a position where you're going to sell direct to consumers through at your farm or maybe through a farmer's market or something like that. But you could also consider other outlets like selling to restaurants um, or other local shops. Uh, you could also think about partnering with other value added producers. So here in this picture, we've got some examples of, uh, it looks like honey producers with different spreads. Maybe you wanted to make a honey butter. And so you could think about calling a local creamery that also does value added production and partnering with them and seeing how you might be able to work together. Another way that you can consider adding value to your uh, business is through agritourism. So agritourism is gonna be more on that service or experience side of adding value. Um, it provides people an experience and lets them really understand the value of your operation. There are still so many people out there that believe that food comes from a grocery store. Um, so this is a great way to build trust and gain knowledge and really make it an experience for people in your community. Some things to think about if you're gonna go the route of agritourism is your location. Um, you wanna think about proximity to a community to engage with. So are you somewhat near a population center where you could draw people in? What impact would this have on your neighborhood? Uh, even if you are in a rural area, think about things like parking. Would you have adequate parking? If you don't, are people gonna be parking along the side of the road and that's gonna create uh, all kinds of safety issues or issues in your neighborhood? Um, you will also wanna think about zoning and other regulatory requirements like maybe insurance and things like that. And then again, just do your research, engage support and interest and good partners can really help you get started with this. And this is another opportunity where you could think about partnering with another value added producer. So maybe you decided that you wanna do agritourism and you're gonna have a pumpkin patch in the fall. 
perhaps you could reach out to a food truck and have them come and be able to serve refreshments while you do that. It's a win-win for both producers and you can work together on that. So depending on what style of operation you have, adding value can present some challenges that you may not have encountered before, such as sourcing ingredients and packaging. So if you are going to do something like a jelly or a lotion, uh, you may have, or you will have, hopefully some of the ingredients that you're going to use, but you may not have all of them. And depending on how much you're going to produce at one time and whatever your style is of production, you may need to buy several pounds of a product at one time or you know, large amounts. It may not be the best, um, cost, most cost effective to just go to your regular retail grocery store and buy those raw ingredients. So those are some things that you could think about. Label requirements is also a big one. And I do not pretend to be the expert in uh, FDA approved labeling or anything, but I just say this to say that they are very specific. Um, there's a business that I've worked with before that almost had to change their name because FDA was a little bit iffy on the name of the business actually making a claim on the label. And so they are very picky and um, may not give just before you start with printing all your labels, make sure that you have everything right and correct. Um, and then again, assess consumer demands. Think about where you're gonna sell, existing competition there, and look for existing market research online. And here in just a second, I'll talk about where you can potentially get access to some of that market research. And then another big one is deciding if you'll need access to a commercial kitchen. Um, and I know, Specifically in the Indianapolis region, there are a couple of shared commercial kitchen opportunities for local businesses to think about. So once you've decided that you're going to go forward with value added production, there are lots of resources out there that can help you. And one of the first ones that I would recommend reaching out to is your local economic development organization. Every county in Indiana has one. And there are several areas that they can help you with. Um, they help with all sorts of small business assistance. They, they, in some cases, can help with financing. Many of them have revolving loan funds through the USDA where they can help provide low interest loans to small businesses. They also are very helpful on regulatory navigation. So in fact, when you're thinking about things like building and zoning permits, um, and in some cases, even maybe fire and building permits. Um, another thing they can be very helpful for is connecting you with other local businesses. So if you're a local business and you're just venturing out, you're most likely going to want to work with someone that you can actually go to their office and talk to them. Your local economic development organization is going to be able to refer you to local insurance professionals or construction professionals, people that really will almost become partners in your business as you move forward. Um, and speaking of local regulatory referrals, the, the local health department is another person that you're probably really going to want to connect with and get to know very well, particularly when it comes to food safety inspection issues. They are going to be the experts in local rules and laws that you're going to need to follow as you move forward with selling your product. Another very exciting and pretty much brand new resource out there is the Indiana Small Business Development Center Agribusiness Initiative. So this was just announced last week, and it is a partnership between the Indiana Small Business Development Center, um, Purdue uh, Extension, Purdue Center for Regional Development, and the Indiana State Department of Agriculture. And what this is, is totally free, no cost and confidential specialty business advising for the agriculture sector in Indiana. And they can help with everything from business advising and training to financing, to crop yield projections, USDA loan packaging, and value added product development, exactly what we're talking about today. Um, I've included the link here on this slide. And if you go to that link, you, there is a um, contact form at the bottom that you can fill out and someone from the ISBDC Agribusiness Initiative will 
get back in touch with you and help you move through the program with whatever specific issues that you may be encountering as you're moving forward in your business. The last thing I wanted to touch on was the Indiana Grown program. So I hope that all of you are familiar with this, but if you're not, Indiana Grown is a statewide branding initiative for products that are grown or processed within the state of Indiana. It is totally free to become a member of this program, but you do have to apply because the Indiana Grown team will just go through and make sure that your product really is grown or processed within the state of Indiana. But you can see it comes with a lot of benefits here. So um, you could use the Indiana Grown logo on your packaging and take advantage of the branding and the power behind that logo that comes already built in. You can also sell in, on the Shop Indiana Grown e-commerce store. And that is a huge resource because I don't know many local businesses that have the resources to put together their own um, e-commerce website and be able to manage that. So that's a huge benefit to Indiana Grown members as well. Uh, every Saturday morning, they do a Wish TV highlight for an Indiana Grown member, so that could be an opportunity for you. Um, then the promotion and marketing and membership network. You know, I think um, small local businesses are a lot more willing to help each other than you might think. It really isn't about competition. Um, and there may be some, you know, specific problem that you're encountering. I'd almost guarantee you that a member of um, someone within the membership network has encountered that specific problem before and can tell you exactly how to navigate it. There is uh, just about 2,000 Indiana Grown members now. So, um, and across every um, industry that we've talked about today, food, textiles, beauty products, all of that. So there is someone that can that has had the same problem and can help you through it. Um, and then the last thing here is the retail store at the Indiana State Fair. So that is located in the Agriculture Horticulture Building. It is an Indiana grown store. It's all just member products in there that um, and is staffed by ISDA staff and volunteers. So Indiana grown members can just come and drop off their products and take advantage of being to reach being able to reach all the people that visit the Indiana State Fair um, during that time. So that's another great opportunity to get your product out there in front of a large group of people. So the last thing I wanted to just kind of talk through was when we're talking about value-added agriculture and value-added production, what we're really talking about is developing a circular economy. And so what I mean by that is just the value that's created, the investment, the jobs that are created by you not only growing a raw product, but adding value to it. We want all that value to stay within the borders of Indiana. And that's really what value added agriculture is. Um, and so I will turn over to Emily to discuss some specific grant resources um, when it comes to value added agriculture. Perfect. All right. So, um, there we go. We're in the same room, so I'm sure we've all had that experience once or twice the past couple of years. So my name is Emily Bice. I'm the Economic Development Operations Specialist here at ISDA. Uh, it's a long title that usually means that I'm the person that helps work with our grant programs, and I also do some business-specific communications. So today um, we're gonna talk through just a couple of different grant programs, just kind of some basic grants 101 to kind of get you started in the grants world. Um, you're gonna see two appear on the screen right now. These are two that I really wanna highlight um, and we'll talk about them a little bit later, but just to kick us off, I always like to start by saying, I'm gonna be the bearer of bad news. Grants is not necessarily just free money. Um, that's kind of the big misconception we see. People think that they associate grant with free money. Um, that's not always the reality. So with grant programs, there's a few things to keep in mind. Uh, first of all, you're going to have to apply. It's going to take time. It's going to take energy. Um, and sometimes it'll take money for you to manage a grant program for your business. So that means, you know, the time. That can be the time it takes for you to apply for a grant program. It can be a complicated process. It can be a little difficult, especially for a small business. That's what a small farm is. You are a small business. And it can be a little difficult to get access to the grant programs through even applying. So just keep that in mind. It's not impossible and there are resources out there to help you. Um, time can also mean the time to manage the grant program. So 
when you have a grant program, there are different expectations that you're going to have to meet there to terms and conditions typically there's going to be reporting requirements you're going to have to be able to back up you know what the results are of your program so that's something to keep in mind it takes time to manage that grant and then money sometimes some grant programs have what's called a match requirement so that simply means that your operation is also going to match some portion of the grant that you would receive so some grants expect that you would match 10% of the funds. Some expect that you'd match 100% of the funds. That just means that whatever grant award you'd be given, you would also match that. And that's something that, especially in federal funds or federal opportunities, that'll be all listed up front for you. So on the screen now, you're going to see just a few different funding opportunities that are out there. So oh, if you back one slide for me, thank you. Uh, up the top there, there are a few ISDA funding opportunities I really want to chat with you about. So. The first one on there is the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program. That's a program that it is closed now, but it's typically annual, so you'd expect it to open early spring. Um, that is run through ISDA, and that's a program that uh, nonprofits, for profits, universities, uh, and local governments are all eligible to apply for. So that's called the entity type. When you look at a grant, you want to look at your entity, the eligible entities, and if you are in one of the eligible entities. So a lot of you will probably be a for-profit. There's also probably some nonprofits on with us today. That means that you'd be eligible to apply. So especially crop block grant program is one that comes up pretty much annually through the ISDA. And that's a program that's designed to help uh, promote specialty crops throughout the state of Indiana. It can't necessarily help one individual business. That is another program we'll talk about here in a second, but specialty crop block grant programs are designed to help the industry as a whole. So the tomato industry, the blackberry industry, melon industry, you name it, um, it's designed to help them as a whole. So it can't necessarily help just your business, but that's one thing to keep in mind if you have an education program that you're doing and you're wanting to expand. Could be a great project for the specialty crop block grant program. We're gonna skip over farmers market promotion program. That's actually a federal opportunity we'll talk about here in a second. And the Clean Water Indiana grant program is another one. Um, we try to be, make sure that our organizations and our businesses are good stewards of the earth. That's another uh, grant program and run through our soil and water conservation program. That might be a good opportunity for you to look at and, and also look at linking up with some of your local organizations to see if they would be interested in applying for that. So now we're going to move down to USDA funding promotion. So we'll start at that farmer's market promotion program. These are all grant programs that are run through USDA um, or the federal government. That means that you would apply directly to the federal government. You would apply through ISDA. You go directly to the federal government and you would apply for these. So these are just some programs to be aware of. The Farmers Market Promotion Program is currently open. It is one that would help if you are looking at starting a farmer's market, you're looking at get, doing that direct to consumer access. That's a program that you could be eligible for. That could be a good funding source. Meat and Poultry Inspection Readiness Grant. So if you are a livestock producer, and you're looking to get federally or state inspected, that's a program that we anticipate opening soon. Uh, anything that's meat related can usually be found on usda.com or usda slash meat.com, .gov. Um, that is a program that would help fund you uh, to get federally or state inspected, which is a very costly process for some folks. This Farm and Food Worker Relief Grant Program, that's one that I want to use to highlight to talk about um, using grant programs, not necessarily for you to apply for, but to use the benefits of them. So everyone, when they give out money, ISDA does it, USDA does it. When you give out money, you want people to know about it. You want people to say, hey, look at all the good things they're doing. Look at all the money they're giving out. Pay attention to those. You'll see a press release that'll come out and it'll say, oh, ISDA through the Specialty Crop Block Grant Program funded XYZ projects. Look at those projects, look at the descriptions, see if it's something that you can get involved in and see if it's something that you could actually benefit from. You don't necessarily have to be the person to apply to a grant to benefit from it. So that's one that would be a good option or that's one that will, another entity will apply for it and then they're going to give out funding based off of that grant program. So that's one that I would say, you know, you would benefit from someone else applying for it. And that's something that you should just keep in mind as you're looking at grant programs. Maybe you're not eligible for it. Someone else will, and potentially that can trickle down to you. I'm um, going to also skip down to the value-added producer grant. So that's one that I think 
a lot of you would be interested in. It's open now. It's open until May 2nd. That's a USDA grant run through, I think it's rural development. It's due by May 2nd. And that's one that can definitely directly help agriculture producers get into value added activities. So that can be helping you process something, help you market something. This is one that is really very relevant to you as a value, someone that's interested in value added production. Um, there's, I think, 19 million total. That's divided out into uh, two different types of grants, planning grants, which is uh, 75 per award, and then working, working capital grants, that's 250 per award. And all that information is available on the USDA Rural Development website on the Value Added Producer Grant. So now we're gonna move on to the next slide here. We're gonna talk a little bit about how do you apply for grants? Um, it's kind of the question of the day. It's hard to get access to some of these things. How do you access these grant programs? One of my number one recommendations is gonna be if you're interested in applying for grant programs yourself, go find a grant writing or a grant management workshop. Um, we, I don't necessarily have ones that I recommend personally, but there are a lot out there. There's a lot of free ones out there. Go and see if you can get some of those resources to write these grants yourself. Because like I was saying before, it can be a little difficult. So that's, a, that's something that would help you acquaint yourself with what grantees or grantors are looking for. How do you apply? What's the right type of wording? What do all these terms mean? Taking a grant writing class can be really useful for something like that. So we're gonna talk about ISDA funding opportunities first. So if you're interested in applying for an ISDA funding opportunities, all of those are available on our ISDA grant management system. That link is on the screen for you right now, but if you're interested in an opportunity that's open, I don't think we have any at this moment, but like I said, just keep checking it back. Um, that's where you would apply. You'd apply on our grant management system and all of our opportunities are listed on our website, in.gov slash ISDA. And if you go to our main website, there's a tile that says funding opportunities, and that's what you'll click on. Federal funding opportunities is the more difficult one. So before I move on to that, I just want to check real quick. If you have a question, pop it in the chat. I know we're moving kind of fast, but this will be here for us. So if you have a question, go ahead and ask it before we move on to the federal part. Anybody I am not there? seeing anyone, but I'll keep an eye out there. Okay, so federal funding opportunities. All federal funding opportunities are usually listed on grants.gov. That's kind of the number one website to remember if you're interested in federal opportunities, grants.gov. So once you go to grants.gov to find the opportunities, you'll notice you first land, there's all sorts of links, all sorts of stuff. You can look at resources for applying. You can look at um, tips and tricks. You're gonna want to go to the search grants tab. So that's where you'll be able to go and actually filter out what grants are there. So one of my personal favorite filters to use is just the agriculture one. So you can you click on the agriculture tab once you're under search grants, and then you'll actually be able to look at all the like agriculture related grant programs. And like I was saying before, every federal opportunity is typically listed on grants.gov. There's a couple of unique ones here or there, but if it's not, um, if it's not something you'd apply to on grants.gov, it's something that it will still be listed on grants.gov. So that's kind of your number one resource for finding a, re a grant. Um, and something I always like to identify when we talk about grants is that all federal opportunities are going to require you to have something called a unique entity identifier or a cage code. And those can be identified for free through sam.gov. And those are just essentially a name tag for your business. So it's a way for the federal government to identify you, to make sure they can pay you. That's something that is required for all grant programs. So if you're interested in doing grants at any point, it doesn't have to be right now, um, I would really recommend you going on and going and obtaining your UEI and CAGE code. They can take a while to get. And the last thing you want is to be ready to apply. You have everything ready, you have the perfect application and you just don't have your UEI or CAGE code. And that just knocks you out of the running immediately. So that's something you can apply for at any time. I'd recommend going on and doing it. If you have what's called a DUNS number, um, I would recommend doing it before April because that April uh, DUNS goes away. And that's something that uh, makes it a little easier to get a U UEI or CAGE code. Uh, I do see in the chat, if you're interested in any kind of like beginning right, beginners uh, grant writing workshop, Jeff has provided one from Purdue. So. 
that's grants in a nutshell. I know I just ran through a whole bunch of information for you. Um, again, I like to really remind people that maybe you can't, maybe you can't apply for a grant. Maybe you don't have the capabilities to apply for a grant at this point. Look at ways that you can benefit from it. Um, one that I'm really promoting right now is the local food purchasing agreement. That's one that USDA is starting and they're going to be giving states funds to purchase food. And you are all places that these states, uh, state entities can purchase food from. So that's one where you see it's been awarded. Look at who's running it, who is, uh, who's the contact for it. Reach out, see if there's a way for you to get involved to have your food be purchased um, as part of that grant program. So with that, I wanna make sure, see if there's any questions for either Victoria or I. Excited if anybody has well, any questions. We really appreciate the opportunity to get on and present this today. Emily and I both um, really enjoyed doing this and appreciate the opportunity to help any of our Indiana agribusinesses. So um, I, will, I will put my email in the chat. And if you do ever um, have any questions or uh, need a link, or um, I've shared the presentation with Jeff, so I'm sure that'll be sent out too. But if you need anything, please feel free to get in touch with me. Um, Victoria and Emily, since uh, we have a little time here left, if uh, we're looking for any chat, any more questions, but um, one question I would have is, so like as far as getting into, like if you start your want to do value added products and you're wanting to do the uh, locally grown or farm raised or what, what are the uh, requirements to go into as far as finding the paperwork that needs to be done to be able to put that on your product? So um, um, that's something that I would start checking with your local health department. Um, obviously, they're probably not going to be involved in regulatory stuff on labeling, um, but I do know that it also varies through industry too. Um, you know, like um, meat processing is something that we got very familiar with over the course of 2020 and everything that happened there. Um, and so there's different levels of different regulatory levels there, which means there's also different things that you can put on the packaging. So um, I would start, I would just start at the local level um, because it also depends on what outlets you're going to. Thank you. Does anybody else have any other questions? If you wanna raise your hand or, um, or if you just wanna chat, type it in the chat box, we can ask a few more questions. We have a few more minutes before we start our next program. Okay, somebody typed in the chat box something about cage codes. Jorge, could you give us a little more information about what you're wanting with that? Oh, he's wanting to know how to obtain one. To, to okay. That's a great question. So cage codes are something you can obtain through SAM.gov. That's S-A-M.gov. Um, that is where you would go through the process to get one. Um, the big thing with cage codes and UEIs are that they are free. So if any, you're on a website that's telling you to pay $50, $100 to get your cage code or your UEI, don't use it, back out, don't pass go. They are completely free to get. You just have to go to SAM.gov. And SAM.gov does have all the resources and kind of walks you through that process and what you'll need. Um, a lot of it will be just making sure that the name you're providing to them to get your cage code matches up with what if you have a DUNS number, your uh, EIN, you have all that stuff um, ready and you make sure it matches because otherwise it can hold up the process. So, you know, even stuff as simple as if you have like corp uh, abbreviated in one and you spell it out in another, you need to make sure it matches because that can make a difference. It's the little stuff. I hope that helps. Happy to answer any other specific questions with it. Okay. 
Thank you very much, Emily. Any other questions? Um, while we're waiting for our next program to start, I uh, do want to mention, I did put in the chat myself, um, Emily did start bringing up Purdue Extension through the Community Development Program does offer a program that's a two-day workshop called Beginner Guide to Grant Writing. We were going to provide some of that or a snippet of that in our conference if we would have been able to do face-to-face -face this year, but if you're interested in taking that class, it is a very good class that will uh, start you out with creating a proposal and then finding grant uh, grant tours and grantees. Um, but if you go to our community development website, uh, list all the workshops throughout the year. I know there's one coming up in Marion County uh, next month. Um, there is a little cost to it, depending on the county that's held in. Um, but there's also, I know one at the end of the summer that I'm actually helping teach in August and September. So if you're interested in that, check out that website that I listed in the chat. Okay. There's no other questions. Thank you very much, Emily and Victoria, for your time today and giving us your information and knowledge on value-added products. And we will now, if we'll start here about in about four minutes. So if you need to stand up and stretch, um, please do so. And uh, we will start our next program right at 1245.
Okay, sorry, folks. I'm trying to figure out this part here. Matthias, are you just seeing the screen itself? Nothing else? Okay. Right. Yeah, just seeing the screen with all the slides off to the left hand side and the first slide there. So, not the actual presentation itself. Well, that's what I was got pulled up. Oh, shoot. Okay, are you seeing it now? Uh, no, I actually see your uh, file explorer with all your files on it. Okay, sorry. Let's try this again. Hey, Jeff, I do have it saved to my desktop. So if you need me to just share, I could do it that way if needed. Give me one second here. Yep. It was should have been working fine. Okay, how about now? There we go, that's it. Okay. And you're seeing the next slide when I present? Uh, not yet, yes, yes. Okay, all right, sorry about that folks. We will go ahead and get started with our next program today. Um, we wanna to introduce, uh, today we're gonna to have a panelist of individuals that are very involved in value out of products with their farm operation. And so I would like to uh, introduce Alicia uh, Rogers and uh, Tracy Hunter and Robin Shannon, who all three will have some time to speak to us today. Uh, we're gonna start out this program with giving each of them about eight minutes to kind of talk about their pr uh, production methods and what they're doing. And so I'm focusing on their first slides as we go through, um, letting them talk about themselves and what they are, what they are currently doing. Uh, why they started their farm project and such, and general startup with value added products, and um, just explain a little bit about what they are doing. So, with that, I will let Alicia start hers and go beyond that. Go ahead, Alicia. Thank you, Jeff. So, yeah, like Jeff said, um, I'm Alicia Rogers. Um, my regular day job <laughs> is I'm an Ag and Natural Resource Educator with Purdue Extension up here in DeKalb County. Um, but once I leave work, um, my husband and I have a small farm in Steuben County. Um, and so basically our primary, primary thing that we raise is dairy goats. Um, currently on the farm as of last night, I think we're up to 185 head. Um, we're almost at the end of our kidding season for this year. Uh, we've had 63 dairy does that have been bred. Um, we have, um, I think we're over 90 kids on the ground at the moment. Um, so we're, we're ready for a little break, um, but a little bit about us. So my husband and I, um, we've been married for almost 10 years now. Um, we have one son, Briar, that you can see here in this photo with one of our bucks. Um, and then my husband has three kids from his previous marriage. Um, so that's where we get our farm name from, D, C, I, and B. Um, so it stands for all the kids' names. So next slide, please, Jeff. All right. So a little bit about our farm history. Um, like I said, we got married about 10 years ago. Um, currently, we have just seven acres in very northeast Steuben County, um, which is the very northeast county here in Indiana. Um, we can reach Michigan in about five minutes and Ohio in less than 10 minutes. Um, so we originally purchased about 5.6 acres back in 2012. Um, we had a really good deal at that point in time. Um, so it has the house, it's got a shop, um, our main barn, and a couple of other outbuildings as well. 
Um, last year, we had the opportunity to purchase an additional 1.4 acres. That's kind of in the front, front lot area um, of our home. Um, and so that's actually become more of our kind of equipment storage, hay storage area now. Um, so that's worked out incredibly well for us. May not seem like a lot, but it's a pretty good increase in terms of the size that we have. Um, so having all those animals, you might wonder how we get the feed. So we do rent about 90, I think we're up to 90 acres of hay ground this year. Um, so we do produce all of our own hay. Um, and then we work incredibly closely with one of our feed mills um, that produces feed for us that does our growth, goats have done incredibly well on it. Um, so primarily with the dairy goats, we do sell most of our males, our weathers as 4-H projects. That's kind of where we got our start. Um, so with our 4-H kids, um, just kind of providing them with really quality stock for those dairy market weather projects. Um, and then we also have um, some dairy calves, dairy beef feeders that we raise up from bottle babies up to finished products. And then we have another property where we raise a few, few head of hogs. We have, I think, three sows, um, but we're finishing, oh, we finished over 30 hogs this past year and direct marketed to consumers. Um, and then we have a few various poultry as well. But for just seven acres, it's definitely more than enough to keep us busy on any given day. Um, so a little bit about our value added product. So next slide, if you could please, Jeff. So for us, um, obviously, like I said, we do raise our beef and our pork and we do have some poultry that we raise for primarily meat as kind of a supplemental income for us. Um, but with our goats, um, we found that with any of our leftover weathers or potentially any cull does that don't really fit into our program anymore, um, that people were kind of a little hesitant on trying goat meat. Um, what they were used to maybe was what they may have purchased in the store or had at a restaurant somewhere that maybe wasn't what they were trying to, wasn't what they liked. Um, so what we thought about was trying to find a product that they would be used to, that they wouldn't necessarily be scared to cook, that they might be um, familiar with. So we had a friend um, that was a retired USDA meat inspector um, that we tried a few out for our own um, consumption first before we worked with our regular processor, um, just kind of producing goat brats. So people love to grill out during the summer and things like that. So we thought a brat would be much more consumer friendly and recognizable than trying to get a goat roast and figure out how to cook that properly. Um, that's kind of what we started here probably about six years or so ago. Um, we started kind of this venture. Um, and so we kind of play around with different flavors and things like that because goat does have a different taste to the meat. So trying to find those flavor profiles that complement and just match that meat really well um, is kind of where we've come up with kind of 10 different flavors um, that we've, we've played with over the years. Um, usually we'll keep four or five different ones in stock or um, that our clients will order when they process, have their goats processed as well. Um, so for us, kind of the combination that we've found is about a 90% goat meat, 10% pork fat combination. Um, because goat is usually a little bit leaner. Um, so by adding that pork fat back in, um, it gives it that nice snap and that nice juiciness. So for us, it's just a simple product, but it's one that's introduced a lot of our customers to a different type of meat. So that's a little bit about our value added product. You're muted, Jeff. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, yes, um, we'll come back to Alicia um, here in a moment and when and ask a few more questions, but we want to introduce our next panelist, who is Tracy Hunter. Um, and uh, he was going to provide some information for us about their operation as well. So from Hunter's Honey Farm. So Tracy. 
Thank you, Jeff. Yes, I'll just give an introduction of myself. We are beekeepers here in southern Indiana. We run about a thousand hives uh, throughout Indiana and Florida and uh, also California. Um, we're diversified all be besides bees is that we also have about 4,000 Christmas trees which started out as our children's college fund. But now that my daughter is in her last semester at Purdue, then now uh, the trees will be a retirement fund. So they're serving dual purposes. And, um, and then we also have about 75 acres of hardwood timber that we manage here on the honey farm. And um, so when I say beekeeping, obviously, you know that we are producing honey and some other products. And the way that I got into this was not by choice, but uh, I was born into it. Um, and uh, about 1910, my great grandfather had an apple orchard in Southern Indiana down in Boonville. And my grandfather put some bees in there and um, he was a beekeeper and school teacher. And then uh, my mother uh, was also a beekeeper and school teacher. And then I taught high school biology for 32 years and was keeping bees. Actually got my degree from Purdue as well. And um, so I have been doing this pretty much all my life. I didn't go commercial until I was in college. And when I, when I bought a guy out and started with about 300 hives, got my first hive when I was just 14 and my grandfather took me to uh, a house. It was actually the homecoming queen's house. And that was kind of a big thing for a middle schooler. But uh, we, we hived us and uh, put it into a hive. And my grandfather said, congratulations, that this is now yours. And so um, that's got my first hive. And I do have to apologize here on my phone. I have such an an ancient computer that I don't have a uh, video on it. So I am using my, my phone for this. I hope you're able to hear and see me okay. And Jeff, I wanted to thank you for setting up the slideshow. Uh, my wife and I just got back last night from Florida. We've been working bees down, down there. And um, it's that the nice thing with the bees in Florida, they can produce about three more crops. And uh, we go down about every two weeks and uh, tend to them and work them. And then we just got back last night. So thank you, Jeff, for putting that slideshow together. Um, and then as uh, so, I guess you could say that I'm a fourth generation beekeeper and school teacher and um, didn't get serious into it till I was in college. And when I decided I did want to be a teacher and then also a beekeeper and um, met my wife, uh, my future wife about this time. She has her fax degree. We used to call home ec degree from Purdue. And uh, she knew what she was getting into uh, when we were engaged. So from the start, she has been my partner and my, my best, uh, I hate to call her employee, but uh, the best worker here on the farm. Um, and she, when we get to these value added foods, she has played a very important role in that. Um, and so as far as our value added products, uh, if you, if, if you get bored during this presentation, feel free to Google huntershoneyfarm.com. And I have spent about the last 35 years uh, waking up in the middle of the night with an idea, um, and then going to the honey kitchen and trying to run with it. Uh, we, my, our motto in my business plan is actually diversification. And I know I'm not the biggest beekeeper in Indiana. We're running about a thousand hives where the largest in Indiana is about 3000, but I am trying to squeeze as many dollars out of each hive as I can. And so we are diversified in many ways already mentioned the Christmas trees and the timber here on the, the honey farm. And we started tapping our maple trees a couple of years ago, and we now sell maple syrup here at the honey house as well. But um, when I say I'm a beekeeper, most people think that I produce honey, which is true. But there's actually seven products that we get out of the beehive. And I, I capitalize on all of them except one. Um, we produce honey, beeswax, bee pollen, 
the bees themselves, uh, I sell bees to beginning beekeepers, people who want to get started. I sell queens. My wife is going to be grafting or making queens here within the next few weeks. And um, then we collect a couple of products that people aren't aware of. Uh, a sticky substance inside the hive called bee glue or propolis or propolis. We collect that. And then there's also royal jelly, which is very time, time um, uh, it's very labor intensive. So I do purchase royal jelly. And then the last item is the venom. Believe it or not, there's a practice out there called apotherapy or bee sting therapy. And I do sting people. I have people that come to the honey farm. Believe it or not, they ask me to sting them. This is for things like brusitis and arthritis. But the most amazing is MS. And I now, over the last 20 years, I've had four individuals come to me totally without me soliciting or knowing the other and stating that they uh, have been helped immensely with their M MS from honeybee stings to the point where they could not walk due to the MS restrictions. But now with multiple bee stings, they are walking and living a normal life. So those are the products that I get from the bees. Uh, and on top of that, not a product, but the most important thing would be the pollination. And our beehives move 10 to 20 times per year. I've already mentioned Florida and California. We go, uh, as soon as they come back from Florida in two weeks, they'll go into apple pollination for 10 days, they'll come out, and then they'll either go into watermelon pollination, pumpkin pollination, cucumber pollination, um, and obviously we're being paid for all these. Remember, I'm trying to squeeze as many dollars out of each hive. Now we take those products and we start adding value to them, and the honey is the easy one. Um, we take it and we start making sauces out of it. Honey barbecue, honey teriyaki, honey mustard. Then we start going farther. We're making things like um, honey ice cream, honey lemonade, honey snow cones. We even, not just human products, but we have honey dog treats. And then we start taking the beeswax and making products out of those. We have beeswax skincare products, lotions, beeswax deodorant. Um, and then I mentioned the propolis, and uh, that is an, an antibacterial product. So we mix it with an alcohol to make a tincture, uh, which can be applied to wounds or taken internally. So we're all of these products, you know, we, uh, we are trying to increase the number of items that the customer sees when they walk into the honey house. I don't want them to, because we are pretty far out in the sticks. Uh, you know, uh, Sam Walton would never have chosen my location for a retail store, but we chose our farm to raise our family. And then we happen to put a retail store on it. And so uh, people have to drive about seven miles out of town to get to our store. So if you live far out, don't think that you aren't able to have a retail store because it is working for us. But when they walk in, they don't just see a jar of honey. They see all these other products that I already mentioned. And, um, and of course, the selling point, we know the power of the tongue. And so we have over 50 different types of honeys for the customer, the visitor to the farm to sample. And um, we infuse the honey. So we have habanero honey and sassafras honey. Um, probably our most popular one is our bourbon barrel orange blossom aged honey. And this is orange blossom honey that the bees produce while they're in Florida. And then I purchased these used bourbon barrels from local distilleries. And then I age my orange blossom honey in there. It pulls the flavor out of the wood. And um, you get that nice little kick from the orange blossom honey. Very, very popular. And, um, but probably our niche, other than value added products, our niche is agritourism. And that I think is so important to the public because as we've already heard from, from Victoria, that uh, you know, our public, our, the US consumer, especially the children are so far removed from their food source. 
that they don't realize that the cow has to be killed for them to have a hamburger or that the goat, you know, has to be milked. And so it just takes, uh, it takes education. So we like to take people, visitors to the honey farm from the bee to the bottle. And we give about four to five different types of tours. They can take the basic honey farm tour uh, and see, and we, we give them about a 15 minute presentation on the biology of the bee and the products of the bees. We show them how we extract the honey. We show them how we dip the candles, how we bottle the honey. And if they are very brave, uh, we will actually take them to the beehive. We open up a hive, we gear them up with their veil, they're protected, and we open up the hive, let them watch the queen, let them watch the bees make honey, and get a taste of honey right out of the hive. That is an experience for an inner city kid. So we take them from the bee to the bottle, and they can actually bottle their own honey bare with their name on it to take home. So they saw the bees make the honey, they saw how the beekeeper gets the honey out of the hive, and then they take the bottle home with them that they, they saw in the hive. So we hope that they have a better understanding how their food is made. So I strongly be believe in that agritourism. You know, I never believed that somebody would wanna watch me fill honey bottles but you know they will watch you and they will pay you to watch you clean out your goat stalls or they will actually help you collect those eggs um, it's just amazing and so this is an important I think part of agriculture if you're trying to make a profit which most of us are then that is don't miss that opportunity uh, just real quickly and I'll close we, um, we sell our products to basically anybody who has money. I've already mentioned our, our uh, on-farm store. We also have an online presence, which I mentioned earlier, hunterstuntingfarm.com. And then we have about four farmer's markets that we go to through the, each week in the summer. We do our county fair, the state fair. Uh, we utilize the Indiana Grown. They are a great, great resource. I highly recommend them. Um, and we sell to about 100 wholesalers, too, uh, who like grocery stores, um, fresh time, health food stores, breweries buy our honey, and then they brew with it, meaderies. So we try to diversify in who we're selling our products to as well. And that's Hunter's Honey Farm in a nutshell. All right. Thank you very much, Tracy. And we'll come back to you uh, if we have time allows. Um, also, so our next panelist that we want to hear from um, is Robin Shannon, and she Ooh. is, oh, come on here, is um, with Canaan Farm Homestead and LLC. So <laughs> at this time, Robin, if you would like to explain to us a little bit about your place, and I'll advance through our slides here um, as you do so. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, I apologize for my exuberant husband in the background. He didn't know that I was unmuted. Um, we are Shannon Farm and Homestead. We began um, really as a, a backyard garden in 2009 when we married. Uh, my husband asked, could he have a small space in our yard to grow vegetables? We're third generation farmers, but wasn't something that we were interested in uh, pretty early on. We just wanted to grow something. We had really stressful careers. My husband, uh, biomed engineer, uh, myself, uh, division director for uh, Department of Child Services. Uh, very stressful career. So having a therapeutic backyard garden was fun. Um, eventually we kind of advanced from the small space in our backyard to uh, plowing over all my flowers and ex <laughs> expanding our garden. We grew so much food uh, very early on that we gave away uh, lawn bags of, of vegetables, um, greens, cabbage, kale, bell peppers. We grew like four varieties of hot peppers. We had sunflowers, tomatoes. And so we gave away uh, lawn bags to family members and friends and church members, we'd walk up and down our neighborhood just giving away food. Um, who knew that such a small backyard would yield so much? Uh, so it was a learning experience for us from the very start. Uh, we went from 
um, just giving away food to people beginning to ask, could they purchase uh, and giving us donations. Uh, so my husband said, I, I, I think we have a business here. And I thought, nobody's gonna buy our food, uh, you know, cause we're giving things away. Um, but little did I know he was right. Um, people need to be fed. And we live in an area where there is food apartheid. We have barriers to food, uh, whether it's transportation or receiving third rated food from some of our larger chain stores. Um, we don't have fresh and affordable food. So we were able to tap a market within our community just by word of mouth. So in 2016, uh, we went from a backyard garden to a full-fledged business, Shannon Farm and Homestead, LLC. Um, <clears throat> our, our purchases increased, our supporters increased, and people began to come directly to our home and purchase right out of our backyard. Uh, we utilized um, all of our friend connections, our church connections, we use Facebook. Uh, we did an unofficial poll to find out what did people uh, really want us to grow. It's difficult to be you know, a master of everything in your garden. And so people decided through our unofficial poll that they wanted us to grow collard greens. They wanted green tomatoes, they wanted peppers. Uh, greens is a main staple in African-American uh, families on a weekly basis. And so there was a huge demand for greens. Uh, so we, we scale back everything that we were growing. Uh, we decided to focus only on uh, collard greens and green tomatoes uh, and uh, hot peppers. We began to take uh, classes we read just about everything that we can find in urban farming so that we could learn more about it. Uh, we connected with Purdue Extension um, and we began to, to, to receive certifications in different areas. And so it opened the door to meeting other farmers within our community. Uh, we began to even market on, on Facebook. And so we went from, again, just a small backyard farm a garden to over 18 raised beds uh, and still growing. Uh, we are uh, hoping to erect hoop houses uh, this summer. One of the things that we, we grew in abundance was peppers, a variety of hot peppers. So because we had so much food, um, my husband said, what can we do with all of this? We just can't you know, let it sit or give it away or sell it. We still have a lot of food. What can we do with it? So my mother-in-law began to teach me how to can and water bath. And uh, I think that first year I probably canned everything but water. It was an experience, it was fun, um, but we still needed to figure out what did we do with all of these peppers that we had. So I love to cook. We went back to the kitchen <clears throat> and we came up with, uh, four different uh, hot sauces. And uh, one was a ghost pepper sauce. One was a habanero sauce with mangoes. Uh, we also came up with a sweet and spicy relish. <clears throat> Excuse me. And from there, uh, we started giving samples away of these products with our um, greens. And so People started asking again, can we purchase these products? We'd like to give them away as gifts. And I thought, oh my goodness, I'm the only one person. How can I handle this? So we began to actually start jarring these products. We had no idea that what we were doing was called value added. We were just simply using the peppers, giving away the sauces with our greens until people started buying them. And as you can see in the slide in the middle photo, uh, we use Dima guns <laughs> pretty early on just to kind of identify our products. Uh, and as we grew, we went to another label, the, the light green label on the, on the uh, left. Uh, and we thought, okay, well, we kind of need to up our game a little bit because now we have restaurants that are asking us to place our products in, in their, uh, in their uh, restaurants for sale. Um, 
So we designed another label uh, and began to uh, really market our product in eight ounce jars uh, to other restaurants, to our community. Um, it's really taken off in a tremendous kind of way. It's a, we can produce 75 to 100 jars uh, a week. Uh, depending on orders. And, and sometimes the, the challenge in that is it's just my husband and I who produce this in addition to running our farm. Uh, so that is pretty much our, uh, our story in, um, in our value added product. We began to distribute our products uh, in CSA boxes. We uh, participate in pop-up shops. Uh, we sell direct from our home with our, our produce, our collard greens and our green tomatoes. Um, and so it's a learning experience. We've had some challenges um, because we'd like to be able to scale up and move from our kitchen. We move from our kitchen to a commercial kitchen. And now we'd like to be able to uh, find a small coal packer to take some of the pressure off of us to do that. The barrier in that is, is that in our region, it's very difficult to small, find a small run coal packer. We do know that Purdue has a food science department and we've been in contact with them several times. Um, it's a little difficult to navigate that system with Purdue to be able to get that uh, information that we need uh, to be able to, to advance our product. Um, but we're continuing to move forward with it, and we're just uh, enjoying the experience and of learning how to uh, market our product, how to move forward, how to grow our farm, um, and it's been a good thing. Thank you, Jeff. Muted again. Sorry about that. Um, thank you very much, Robin. I appreciate that. So does anybody have any questions? I've got some uh, things I can ask, but I do, we had in the chat, I do see uh, where do you grow today? As there, and um, the person that put that in the chat, is it you have somebody specific that you want to ask that question to or all three? I can answer that for Shannon Farm. Right now we grow in our backyard. We have uh, about 700 square feet that we grow our produce in, our peppers and our collard greens. Uh, we are on the hunt for additional properties. We're looking for about 10 acres uh, with a house and some buildings so that we can expand our business. Uh, Tracy, do you wanna add anything to that? Um. So we have our bees uh, in several out yards. We probably have 20 different yards. I don't know if there's any beekeepers in the audience. And even if you are trying to grow more produce or, or more livestock, I'm constantly, as I drive around, looking for places I could put my hives or land that's for rent. Um, I rarely pay to put my bees down. I normally give them a jar of honey or I might mow their field if I've got my bees in their field. Um, so that's how we, we do that. Okay, um, in the chat as well, Robin, we have a question. Somebody wondered what kind of training uh, was required to do your canned products? Well, um, actually I am Serve Safe certified. I uh, also took some classes with Purdue in how to can and water bath uh, after the experience with my mother-in-law uh, so that we could become certified in uh, making sure that we have the proper knowledge in order to do that. Relish is different from jams. Uh, you have to, have, they have a really high acidic content. So it's really important to make sure that you have the proper training to do that. You have any other questions out there? I got a question just um, in general that I asked you guys to think about. Um, what things have you done to add to the value added products to improve them over time? I know you kind of mentioned a little bit already. And I uh, apologize. All we have right now is Robin and Tracy. Uh, Alicia had to, to jump off to another program. But if you guys have anything on that. Well, to be able to um, 
to improve our product, we did experiment with a number of different peppers uh, to uh, increase the flavor. We didn't want our product to just be hot. We want to make sure that there is an actual flavor, a taste to it that would uh, tantalize people's palates and want uh, increase the interest in uh, purchasing. Uh, so we did uh, we did experiment with a number of ones and finally settling on the one that we use currently. Um, labeling is important. We had to uh, change our labeling so that it was attractive to the visual. Uh, I, we wanted people to be able to see it um, and identify with it every time they saw it. So we needed to have something that was colorful, something attractive. Just in, in having the classes that I went to, I learned what was necessary in labeling. And so that was important. You have to have your address on it, your phone number, where it's manufactured, the ounces, the ingredients, the nutritional value, uh, so that was something that we changed to from very early on. I think Robin just answered one of the next questions that came in about what information did you include on your product labels. But uh, Tracy, do you have anything that is particular that's um, as well with the honey that you had to provide information on? You're on mute, Tracy, sorry. Wanted to make sure I stay, stayed on mute. Uh, I'm like Robin. I had to go back and I had to look at those labels and make sure that they were legal weight and ingredients. Um, when the health inspector comes, they look at those. Uh, mm -hmm. We did have to send our relish to Purdue to have an acidity test. Um, and then I, I think... I don't know if this is the right place for this, but don't try to hide anything. Try to stay as legal as possible before you do anything. Check with the Board of Health. Check with your zoning. Um, I just, out of the blue, started making sassafras honey where I dug up sassafras roots and infused it in the honey. Come to find out sassafras is a carcinogenic and it's illegal to sell it as a food product. So when the Board of Health came, they made me dump out $200 of uh, sassafras honey into the trash can. And so if had I had checked into that earlier, I might have saved myself some money. So try to cover all of your bridges before you go down that road. Robin, have you had any other label things that you'd like to add that you had to, that you and already mentioned. You need to unmute yourself, Robin, sorry. I apologize. Other than the cost of purchasing labels, I mean, you have to really shop around. Labels get to be really expensive, just like jars. Uh, there was a shortage on ball jars for a while. Uh, so it was really difficult to, to find that. But labels are expensive and you have to shop around and you need more than one label. You know, we actually have three labels on our jars. And so uh, you want to make sure that it's cost effective for you. Great, thank you. Do we have any other questions? I've got one more if, if nobody else else have anything. Um, Tracy and Robin as well. Um, what other avenues did you guys encounter or enhance to do to enhance your products? I mean, I know Tracy mentioned a little bit and you both mentioned, but what are some things that you um, have done? I mean, in relation to maybe uh, adding a different name to your product to make it more enticing or uh, what did you go out as far as like promotion to get people to buy? Uh, well, with uh, Robin's Sweet and Spicy Relish, we, we initially just called it Sweet and Spicy Relish. Um, we tried to figure out what would be catchy because, you know, the name identification is important. People remember names. There's McDonald's, there's Heinz Ketchup, you know, there's Coca-Cola. Branding is extremely important. Um, and so we came up with Robin's Sweet and Spicy Relish. I'm not sure that it will continue to be that. But right now, that's what it is because people would always say, can I have some of your relish? You know, where's Robin's relish? I need Robin's relish. Uh, and so we just kind of fell into that name. Uh, but we're hoping to, um, <clears throat> you know, maybe, you know, in the future, we may change that depending on as we move forward in, in uh, production. 
Um, is there anything that you guys encountered as you went into trying to find markets? Like, you know, Tracy mentioned about hitting some of, some of the uh, retail stores. Um, what, are, what was your gimmick to get them to jump on board with you? I use samples. It was really simple. I used samples. I went in and we gave away, we gave away so much relish in the very beginning. We um, utilized our friends who own businesses um, to be able to get our product out there. Um, you know, so we just went door to door. It takes a lot of legwork. It takes a lot of word of mouth. Uh, it makes, it takes, uh, you following up with what you say you're going to do. You have to make sure that you meet your deadlines, that you meet the, the volume of products that people are asking for. That creates a level of trust and respect in your community that you're able to deliver what you say you're going to deliver. Um, we've encountered situations where people, uh, one restaurant in particular wanted a certain volume that we just couldn't meet. And, and so that becomes a barrier for us sometimes as a two person crew. So that's why we'd like to be able to scale up through, um, uh, you know, some additional means of co-packing. Tracy, do you have anything to add to that? Oh, I just wanted to agree with Robin on the importance of labeling, branding, and then getting your name out, advertising. And it can be as small as putting a sign in your front yard or, mm -hmm. you know, a Facebook page. Um, and then I would get to, uh, as far as getting it to the public, start small, whether that's a farmer's market or a festival that, that you can set up. And then if you do get into a store, then offer uh, a day of tasting, go in on a day morning and stand there, buy your product and pass out free samples mm -hmm. when allows that. And uh, the power of the tongue is just so important. Once they taste that sauce, yes. once they taste that, that honey, they say, wow, that is good. And they notice the difference. And when you do label it, make sure it says that it's different, whether it's Robin sauce or whether it's local honey or free range chicken eggs, uh, you know, make sure something special about it, that it's different from Heinz ketchup or uh, just Kroger eggs. So that branding and, and, and advertising is so important. Um, and I, I might add, I'm not real good with social media, but you know, Facebook is such an easy, inexpensive way to get out there. If you have a page and you can post daily, you can post weekly, you can put pictures, you can put videos, it's a, and you can put out recipes, uh, directions, maps, events, whatever you're doing is a great way to do it. In, inexpensively. Okay. Tracy is right. We do utilize Facebook. Um, I can, I post three, four o'clock in the morning. I'm not disturbing anybody. Um, I post pictures of, you know, we have collard green Wednesday and, you know, so our, our customers, our friends and family on Facebook, they know Wednesdays is today is the day to be able to purchase these items. Uh, it's a special day. And then I also use our value added product. And I start with the teaser of posting pictures of our jars coming soon, coming Friday, get your orders in. I take orders direct from Facebook. Uh, and, you know, so it's easy for people to do that. I set up times and dates for people to be able to come and pick up their products. We also deliver to senior citizens and those who are homebound for free. Uh, and those people who are able to access social media. So it is a most powerful tool and it doesn't cost you very much of anything to be able to advertise there. I, I wish we could uh, keep talking. I know there are a lot of people, there's a lot of great information. We're ending up the, the wrapping up the end of our program for today. But we do want to thank Tracy, Nathaniel, and Alicia for their time. I did put all three of their emails in the chat. Um, and we also want to thank um, Emily and uh, Victoria as well for their time from the USDA. But before we wrap up, we do want you to be aware on the screen right now, you should see another QR code um, that provides us with some survey information that we'd like from today's program. So if you would do the same and uh, capture that QR code on your phone or click on the link that Matthias has placed in the chat box, please do that at this time. We'd appreciate it. 
um, all your information that you can do. So I'll leave that up for about 30 seconds and then we'll conclude with our program with uh, two more slides here. But thank you, Tracy and Nathaniel for helping us out today and Emily. And thank you, Jeff, it's Robin, but thank you so much for oh, the invitation. <laughs> Sorry about that, Rob. Nathaniel will be my other half. <laughs> I was reading off the screen where you're putting was looking at your video picture. Sorry about no, that. No, it's okay. Thank you so much for the invitation. I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the information. All right, so we will advance on to our next uh, two things that we need to finish up. Um, thank you for all the time that you're able to do this. Um, and, you know, we're open to a lot of different programs through Extension. Um, we want you to save the date. Um, we plan on, we hope. Um, in 2023 to provide the uh, Indiana Small Farm Conference face-to-face -face at the Henders County Fairgrounds. So pull ahead and put those dates in your calendar for March 3rd through 5th. And uh, once again, we want to thank uh, the Safe Produce Indiana for being our uh, program sponsor for today. And all of you uh, joined us. And thanks for Matthias for uh, being on today and moderating our chat and Sarah Vaughn and Tamara Benjamin and or Ingwell for being an integral part of putting all these programs together today. So thank you and have a great weekend. Enjoy the uh, sun for what last a few more hours today and uh, we'll see you soon. Thank you very much.